Much has been said and written about the segregation of the Old South in the volatile civil rights days. Now comes a new book that adds the perspective of a federal judge. As a native of Jackson, William Alsop witnessed firsthand the racist attitudes of the day and tried to do his part to change them. He tells his story in one over. Judge Alsop, thanks and welcome. It's good to have you back in Jackson. A pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, and of course, you, you flew in and you're, you're about to head up to Ole Miss and do a presentation with Charles Overby. Charles Peanut Overby. Yes. I, see, I couldn't believe that you guys both went to, to Provine together. Provine. I was the class of 63. Mm -hmm. He was the class of 64. We were friends back then. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Overby, as I refer to him, it's, his friends call him Peanut, but you know, he was at the Clarion Ledger for a long time, and now he's at Ole Miss and with Mississippi Today. Of course, I do work there. So, I mean, I'm like, yes, sir, Mr. Overby. But <laughs> that, it's neat, though, that y'all both went to school together. Um, what was it about Provine at that time? Because it seems like so many famous people came out of there. We had a lucky group of students, Yeah. Uh, fantastic teachers, even though it was the poorest state in the Union at, in those days, for some reason, the stars lined up. And we had great teachers, and I give a lot of credit to, the, to those teachers. And we had some, some excellent students. I think a lot of those students came from parents like mine who had gone through the war. Yeah. And they, had, they were single-minded about get an education, get an education. I heard that a lot myself, but my friends tell me the same that so we we had parents who were encouraging us to get the best education we could you are a true baby boomer you were born right after right at the end of the war in between ve day and vj day yeah. i was born was your dad your dad was in the war he was he was in north africa oh wow okay so he, you know, like I said that was a big thing on education so they pushed that on you what was it like growing up in jackson when you were a kid I'll get to the segregation part right. uh, in just a moment, but growing up in those days was like a, a rural experience for kids. We were right on the edge of town. I would go out and play in the woods, uh, shot my BB gun in the woods, swung on vines, climbed trees, uh, worked on the cornfield, worked in the garden, mowed the yard. I did all the things that a kid, classic boyhood stories. Uh, played sandlot baseball. Uh, it was, it was, uh, I had a great childhood, to, to be honest. Uh, the, that comes through, I think, in the little memoir that I wrote, but the main purpose of the memoir was to tell a different story sure. about, about Mississippi then, which was the, uh, the, the, the huge racial divide that uh, we grew up under. Uh, one word summarizes it, segregation. Exactly. Segregation. Well, so many people I've talked to that grew up in about the same time that you did said that they, they were almost oblivious to what all was going on because it was almost like they were on, on an island. We had two different tracks. Yeah. There was the white track, the black track. Yeah. And in, in a sense, that was very true. Uh, but there were times when the two races came together. Right. And this, so this I'll give you an example. On a Saturday morning around 10 o'clock on Capitol Street here in Jackson, if you had gone there, there were two huge stores, Kennington's and the Emporium, right, right in the shadow of the governor's mansion. And those streets and sidewalks were jammed, just jammed with people who came from all over central Mississippi to do their shopping on a yeah. Saturday morning. And it was black and white alike. Really? This is one time that the races did come together, and that's why there were the, the separate, the separate uh, water fountains, for example, mm -hmm. was because the races did mix on, on occasions like that. So there were, there were times when the two races were together. Uh, the merchants, of course, wanted the money from as many people as they could, they could get. However, for the most part, the schools were completely segregated the churches were completely segregated. The restaurants would not allow a black person in. Uh, the hotels would not. It was a uh, it was a really an apartheid system is the best way to describe it right here in right here in our own country. Well, you, and you hear you talk about your parents wanted you to become educated, and yet that was going on 
It, it seems like the two just don't don't mix. Well, my yes, that's true. But yeah. my 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 mom and dad were from Texas, right? And they either believed in or at least accepted segregation as the the way of life. They believed right. in quote separate but equal. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they were quiet. They didn't preach it, but they also taught us decency and fairness. Mm -hmm. And in time, as you're growing up and you see the system and you begin to see the system, while my mom and dad believed in segregation, at the same time, they taught us decency and fairness. Right. And as a youngster at, say, age 13, 14, or 15, you begin to see that those two things are in great conflict. That's part of the why I wrote this memoir was to describe how that, how young people in that era, young white people in that era, right. came to see that conflict and, and what they did about it. Some people went with the flow and didn't do anything about it. Uh, others, uh, like my friend Danny Cupid, he uh, eventually uh, found the courage and helped me find the courage to try to do something, make, make a statement on the right side of history. How did, how did Danny do that? We were roommates in college. Mm -hmm. We also went to went to same Provine High School, I should say, and he was a star on the football team. I was not. I was unathletic, but we wound up being roommates at, at state. And I'll just tell one brief brief story. At that time, no African American had ever given a speech at any quote white college in Mississippi ever. Right. Well, we thought a man named Aaron Henry should come and give a speech. He was the state president of the NAACP. He was black. He lived in Clarksdale. He was a pharmacist. And we wanted him to come and give a speech on our campus. So we put his name in to be the next speaker, one of our speakers. And the state board of trustees, as well as the president of the university, said, no. Now, this is at Mississippi State. I should make right. that very clear. And uh, this was in the in 1966. Okay. So we uh, we said this is wrong. We protested. We wrote. Uh, then I we decided. Danny wrote a somewhat famous memorandum saying we should bring a lawsuit. I still have my copy of that. We should test this. This is not right. That uh, uh, the First Amendment says we can have speakers. Well, it was not an easy thing to uh, to uh, contemplate because there were all kinds of ways to get retaliated against, and you certainly would be cutting off your your uh, future uh, yeah. sources of employment. But eventually, I went with Danny and I said, "I'm I'm going to do this with you," and so I wrote a letter to the president of the school of MSU saying that this was wrong. We were going to bring a lawsuit to test it in federal court. And then the school and the board of trustees backed down. Really? They did. And Aaron Henry was allowed to come and speak. And in January 1967, Aaron Henry came and gave a speech, the first speech by any African-American ever in a, on a white campus in yeah. Mississippi. I put white in quotes. Uh, uh, ever. And it was a tremendous uh, he even got a standing ovation that was started by some of the teachers up front. Uh, they stood and slowly everyone in the auditorium at the end stood to give him an ovation. It, 750 people came to hear that. It was very well attended. His speech was on the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which had just been enacted and was just mm -hmm. getting underway in Mississippi at that time. Every prediction he made on that evening came to be true. What were uh, some of the predictions he made? Well, he said this was going to enfranchise blacks, mm -hmm. and blacks were now going to vote, and blacks were almost a majority in the state, and in many counties were in a majority, right. and that that was going to vastly change who got elected to local office in, the, in Mississippi, all, all of which came to be true. That's amazing. You got a standing ovation, and there was nobody from the Sovereignty Commission writing down names or anything. Well, there, there probably yeah. was from the Sovereignty Commission, but I want to say I was proud of the students there yeah. at Mississippi State. Unlike Ole Miss, where they had had riots, yeah, uh, only uh, and that was only five years earlier when James Meredith came. Uh, it was peaceful uh, yeah. at uh, Mississippi State, and those I'm proud of those faculty members who stood up to uh, start uh, a standing ovation. That was. Uh, 
That was a, something I hadn't even thought of myself at the time, and, and yet they had, and they stood right in the front center to, to cause that to occur. You went to Mississippi State for mathematics, right? I started in engineering okay. and wound up, when I decided to go to law school, I switched over to mathematics. Okay. So I was going to ask how you ended up at Mississippi State, but that makes sense if you're doing engineering. So I wanted to be an engineer when I started out. And you ended up being a judge. I, owned, I did. <laughs> Funny how life takes its little twists and turns. Now, now, what year again did you graduate from Provo? 63. So you were here when Medgar Evers got shot in Jackson. There it was indeed. So yeah. what was that like during that I, time? I, I wrote a, a diary entry. I kept my older sister, yeah. who was, was very influential on me. Uh, she said, keep this diary. She gave me a five-year diary. Really? Had this little, so I, I kept a diary, and uh, uh, most of them had were inconsequential entries, of course. But whenever he was uh, uh, shot, I said, this is tragic. Wow. Uh, uh, that was the next morning. Uh, yeah, we woke up to the the newspapers had it. Uh, Clarion Ledger had yeah. the headline, and uh, and the Clarion Ledger in those days was a very racist newspaper, mm -hmm. not the one it is today, of course. And the Clarion Ledger uh, said a Californian arrested, <laughs> and that and that was because Byron D. LeBeckwith had uh, spent. A, a, a few weeks of his life when he was young in California. The rest of the time he had been raised in Mississippi, but the spin, that was part of the propaganda was yeah. to, to blame to blame California. Somebody from outside, obviously. Outsiders. So, I mean, here you were, and like I said, you mentioned how it could destroy your future, but you still had the courage to stand up and, and speak out. I, I mean, what, what brought that on? Just this inner sense of you just need to do what was right? I had, or you had good uh, friends that also pushed I, I you. I had my friends who pushed me a little, yeah. and also a mentor at the YMCA that I was very active in, campus YMCA that I was active in. His name was Kermit Clarty. He okay. was the uh, faculty advisor, uh, uh, a minister, and and through through the Socratic method, I would say, <laughs> he taught us uh, that you should be. He believed, like James in the Bible, that you should be doers of the words and mm -hmm. not just listeners or sayers of the word, uh, doers of the word. And uh, so that, I, at that time, I was a pretty religious guy, and I felt, okay, this is the right thing to do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do what Jesus would have done. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's how I got the courage. Where'd you go to church back then? In those days, I was a Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you went downtown, or did you go? Well, in, in Jackson, yeah. we went to the Alta Woods Presbyterian okay. Church. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've spoken there before. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. That's pretty cool. Now, when you said you lived on the edge of Jackson, just, just out of curiosity, I've been thinking, where was the edge of Jackson when you were Well, McDowell up? Road okay. was uh, the edge of Jackson when we moved into our house in 1948. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Jackson moved progressively yeah. south. So uh, by the time I left, we were not really at the edge, but in 1948, it was very close to the edge of Jackson. So when the March for Fear happened, you were a witness to that, weren't you? I was, uh, not, not the whole thing, but right. I, but in 19, the summer of 1966, uh, uh, for, for, for your listeners, that was the march where Medgar, not Medgar Evers, uh, uh, James Meredith, James Meredith yeah. uh, started in Memphis and was going down to Jackson on a walk, 225 yeah. miles. And on the very first day, some, somebody shot him, yeah. almost killed him. Thankfully, he survived. And, uh, but Martin Luther King and Stokely Carmichael and a lot of others picked up the, the fallen banner and they uh, continued the march. Well, when the march got to Tougaloo College or was coming in, they, there was a big rally. And so Danny and I went that night to the rally uh, to, support the, to support the march. So that was a, that was a very memorable evening. I, I'm proud that I was able to do that. Yeah, talk about it a little bit. What was it like? Well, it was a, it was a hot summer <laughs> evening. That's the first thing. And a lot of cars were parked there. We came in parked on the grass. Yeah. And then we walked there. Many people were dotted along the, uh, the hillside there overlooking the stage area. Uh, outdoor is an outdoor stage. Yeah. And they, they had their dates with them. And it was, it was a festive, uh, festive moment, I think. And then, uh, at the 
at the uh, stage itself, uh, there were a number of famous uh, uh, people who were there to entertain the, the troops. Uh, and I remember as we were walking in the, uh, the television, not the television, the, uh, 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 the announcer was saying, this march cost us $35,000 and we need for you to make some contributions. And I said, he said, we don't want you to make contributions, we want you to make sacrifices. <laughs> and he says, you know the difference between a sacrifice and a contribution? He said, a chicken makes a uh, contribution to breakfast, but a hog makes a sacrifice. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, it was it was a festive uh, festive moment, and but a proud moment, and because the next day they were going to go all the way into the state capitol and and end the rally there on the steps of the of the capitol, which they did. They did. When you decide to go to Mississippi State, like you said, and, and the Aaron Henry story was great, but the reason I think it was at Tougaloo was much for the same reason why Aaron Henry couldn't speak there, because at Jackson State was a state school, and they wouldn't let... So that's why Tougaloo became kind of a hotbed for everything, wasn't it? Well, Tougaloo was a private Yeah, private, private college. So they didn't, they didn't have exactly. to... Exactly, right. and so the, uh, the there was no state board to clamp down on yeah. Tougaloo College, thankfully, like there was on the rest of the, the publicly public schools like yeah. Jackson State. I think that's your point, yeah. Yeah, so when you decide to go off to, to, to law school, when you graduate from Mississippi State, I mean, did you ever think that you would not come back to Mississippi? I thought I would come back. Yeah. I thought I would, and in fact, I did come back uh, after law school and I clerked a year for Justice Douglas, my wife and I did come back. Okay. And Danny and I practiced law for six months with uh, a lawyer named Dixon Piles and a woman named Betty Tucker. Mm -hmm. and But the finances of that were not so good. And I was borrowing $1,000 a month to live on. Wow. And had nothing to fall back on. And when I realized that the practice just couldn't support four families, uh, I made a very hard decision, which was to pick up and leave and go to California, where my wife had, had been from. So. That was a sad, hard moment for me to. Oh, I always we we'd even bought a house. We had we had to sell the house and pick up and move. Did you do you still have family here? Or are they? No, my mom lived here until '74. Then she passed away. My dad died in 1960. Okay. And uh, my two sisters uh, moved elsewhere. So. The only family I have left is really just my good friend, Danny Cuban. Danny, yeah, which yeah. I got to meet. Just a moment ago. Yeah, he's driving you around today. He is. He's my chauffeur. Talk about him. He stayed here. What What did he do after, after well, you left? Well, Danny stayed on with Dixon, uh, even though yeah. they weren't making money. But he eventually left, too, Yeah. and started his own practice. And uh, thankfully, at first, had a spouse who was earning a living as a teacher, and that could support them. And then Danny hit it big with the asbestos cases. Yeah. Uh, at first, those no one would take those cases because uh, the asbestos companies were just no, we're never going to pay. It's like the tobacco companies. Right. And but finally, Danny uh, hit big, and uh, that that was uh, his great moment uh, where uh, then everything flipped around, and now he's done great for himself ever since. When you went up to Harvard, of course, you got your law degree, but you also got a public policy degree. I did, yeah. A very prestigious JFK school for, for, for government up there. Well, how did that come about? I was in my second year at Harvard in law school and thinking I was going to come back to Mississippi, and I had no training at all in public policy. And so the Kennedy School opened up a new program called a joint degree with the law school and the Kennedy School. Yeah and all you had to do was spend one extra year, and you would get two degrees. So I said, that's pretty good. So I went over and talked to the uh, people at the Kennedy School, and I think they wanted geographic diversity. Huh. They wanted the idea of somebody from Mississippi being in their first class appeal to them. So they gave me a full scholarship, so I couldn't turn that down. So that, yeah, that's what happened. Uh, I uh, signed up for that, and really the reason was I thought I would come back and spend the rest of my life here in Mississippi. But you get, but you didn't. I didn't. You didn't. But I mean, I it's it's worked out pretty well for you, needless to say. And I hate to skip over too much, but in '99, Bill Clinton appointed you uh, to your job that you have now. 
Yeah, I'll come to that, but I, I just want yeah. to say I admire so much people like Danny. Yeah who have given their entire lives to making this state better. Something I did not do myself, I freely admit. Uh, and there, there are people like that, yeah. that uh, I admire who had opportunities elsewhere, said, no, I'm gonna st stay at home and make Mississippi a better place. Yeah, coming to that. Yeah. I, uh, I, I was a trial lawyer for almost 25 years in San Francisco. I loved trying cases, I thought I was good at it. And I applied when Bill Clinton was, a, was our president and eventually uh, was selected for uh, a district judge. And I have served now almost 20 years. It'll be 20 years this August. And you've had some incredible cases. We won't get too much in the weeds about that because I know you probably can't talk too I much can't about, talk the about the cases. But that's, but that's okay. And, and the reason I say that is um, you've also gotten very involved in hiking. Yes. Yeah, which is in, this, in the Sierras Correct. out there. So which you're gonna make a couple hikes this year too. I am, I have done 150 plus real backpacking trips, not just yeah. day hikes, no, the, not pack animal trips. These are where you carry your stuff on your back and you go out for several nights usually, I, sometimes just one night, but average of three or four nights and explore the high Sierra. Yeah. And I have gotten good at that. I'm yeah. a good mountaineer, I'm Very a good mountaineer. Well, what, what made you decide to sit down and write the book? I mean, did you just stumble across your diaries one day? or No, what? I'll tell you what it was. Uh, the, it's a painful thing in a way, but uh, a, uh, I had, in a case, I, you, you, not every time does the right, not, I shouldn't say, the right side always wins, but who, who thinks they're right may not win. So I had a case involving an African-American in an employment case, and on the record I had the right thing to do was to rule against the African-American. Yeah. Well, the lawyer then made a motion for me to recuse myself. And his basis was you were born and raised a white kid in Mississippi, and so you are uh, the victim of residual racism. And you should bow out of this case and let someone else uh, take it. Yeah. Well, I actually thought about it for a while, because I, I, we were both old enough to have remembered the lawyer and me, at the, remembered the 50s and the 60s, and so I thought about it. And I eventually I wrote a little short uh, order that said, no, I'm not gonna recuse myself. I'm going to, the right thing to do is to deny this motion. And I said, growing up in Mississippi opened and not closed my eyes to the cruelty of racism. And I really believed that. That was the impetus for me to write this. That was back in 2011, by the way. Uh, I, and I spent the next six years, uh, when time permitted, uh, working on this memoir. Recently, you got to come back to Mississippi State. I did. What did you expect? I thought I was, uh, they, they wanted me to come and give a talk about the book. book. I said, great, I'll be happy to do that. So uh, I thought I might get 40 people to come and I would have been proud of that. Uh, 220 came. Wow. It was standing room only, mm -hmm. people standing in the back. I was blown away by that. I really, it was a, quite, a, quite a homecoming for me. So. It was, it was tremendous. What are your thoughts about Mississippi and how it's changed or how it hasn't changed? You know, I'm an outsider. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm an outsider and I have to be careful here because yeah. I know, having grown up here, I know how Mississippians don't like outsiders to tell them about how to run their state. Right. Uh, I am proud of the progress Mississippi has made from yeah. the days I lived here, very proud. Now, it's a half glass half full type thing, but I believe it's half full and not half empty, and eventually we're gonna get to where we should be. There's, there's room for improvement. By, by, the place where I've, I think the most improvement has been made is if you go to the campus at State now, 18% mm -hmm. are African-American students. It was zero when I started, 18%. Right. Uh, if you go to a restaurant or to a hotel, you will see African-Americans as welcome as anyone else. That never would have happened when, when, when I was a kid. Uh, employment, same thing. Uh, the place where I feel there's an issue, and this is nationwide, not just yeah. in Mississippi, is in education. And our, our public schools are becoming minorities mm -hmm. and very few whites. And the white kids are all going to, not all, but many are going to uh, private schools, or private academies, and that deprives us of that that uh, thing that uh, Justice Frankfurter uh, 
admired about the public school system, which was it was kind of a melting pot of, uh, of ideas, of diversity, of uh, it's a place where uh, a poor kid who's an immigrant from some country can come and be exposed to the United States and, and learn just like the rest of us. Public school system was a wonderful thing all the way up till, till uh, really the, I'm gonna say white flight from the public school system. So we have to figure out a way to fix that. And I, and I don't have the solution, but I'm just saying that's the, that's the problem that I see here, but I also see it in my hometown yeah. in, in Oakland, California. As we wrap up, what advice would you give, say, a 16-year-old that sees an injustice or a wrong but hasn't quite gotten the courage to stand up for what is right? What, what advice would you give them? Well, be deliberate. Uh, think it through. Mm -hmm. Don't be rash. Uh, talk to some people. Uh, make sure that what you want to do is, the, is not just a spur-of-the-moment thing. But if after all of that, your heart tells you that you got to stand up for what's right, then you should stand up for what's right. I sure appreciate you coming in and coming back to Mississippi, and I hope you have a good trip up to Oxford. It's been my pleasure. Are you going to bring a cowbell and ring it or anything? Not this time. Okay. <laughs> Very good. I love spending the time. This was really a great interview. Thank you, Marshall.